Welcome, everyone, to the George Washington University here in our nation's capital. I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International and Economic Policy at the Elliott School of International Affairs. Thanks for being here today for our 13th annual China Conference, now held in several installments during this unusual academic year. Today's keynote address is by David Lampton, or Mike to his friends, who's of Johns Hopkins SAIS University, and is aptly entitled, The Biden Administration Turns to a Deteriorating U.S.-China Relationship. Our discussant today is Deb Rolaire, Vice Chairman and Executive Director of the Paulson Institute and a distinguished graduate of the Elliott School. Thank you both for being here today. The moderator for today's event is Barbara Stallings, who's a distinguished visiting scholar here in the Institute. Now, in just a moment, I'll call upon Barbara to describe our conference and introduce our speakers. But before then, I'd like to thank some other friends who helped make the China Conference possible. In the Elliott School, the Seeger Center for Asian Studies, supporting research on Asia, promoting interaction, and educating the next generation. And in the School of Business, GW Cyber, the Center for Business Education and Research promoting an understanding of institutions, inclusive globalization, and U.S. competitiveness. Thank you for co-sponsoring today's event. And to the Elliott School's Acting Dean, Ilana Feldman, and the Dean's Advisory Board, and many others who've supported the Institute's work throughout the years, including Frank Wong, Ning Li, and Dan Stramiello. Thank you for your sustained efforts. And finally, to our great IIEP team, Operations Manager Kyle Renner and the dozens of GW students in events, media, and research who make sure that the trains run on time. Thanks for your extraordinary service in this time of a pandemic. Now, for those of you who haven't participated in an IIP event, you can expect a lively and informative conversation on such topics as urbanization, multidimensional poverty, global economic governance, green finance, and digital trade. Our Envisioning India series convenes experts from finance and economics to paint a vivid picture of this important economy. Next Friday, Vijay Kelkar and Ajay Shah will provide a diagnosis of India's growth slowdown since 2011, with discussion by Ashima Goyal and Devesh Kapoor. And on Wednesday, the 27th, our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series resumes with Sir David Hendry, and Dr. Jennifer Castle with an amazingly clear and important presentation, Taking Stock of Climate Change, Earth, Air, Fire, and Water, with discussion by Anne Florini and Sunil Sharma. Be on the lookout for these and other events on our website at iiep.gwu.edu. And if you miss an event, you can go to our YouTube channel, IIEPGW to relive the experience asynchronously. I now welcome my colleague, Dr. Barbara Stallings, to the virtual dais to take over the proceedings. In addition to GW, uh, Barbara is research professor at Brown University's Watson Institute and also a distinguished visiting professor at the Schwarzman Program at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Her most recent book, Dependency in the 21st Century, The Political Economy of China-Latin America Relations, was selected as one of Foreign Affairs' Best Books of 2020. Welcome, Barbara. The mic is yours. Okay. Um, over the last 13 years, with the support of colleagues, alumni, co-sponsors, and the Ning Li Family Endowment, IEP has successfully built a leading forum in Washington for addressing issues critical to Chinese development and to U.S.-Chinese economic and political relations. We're especially indebted to Professor Maggie Chen, Professor of Economics at GW and former IIEP Director for her leadership in these activities. Our annual conference has featured more than 100 leading scholars and has attracted more than 2,000 participants from around the world. As James explained, because of the pandemic this year, the 13th annual conference is taking place online and through a series of lectures and panels rather than a one-day conference. 
During the fall semester, we had a keynote address by Professor Carmen Reinhardt, Chief Economist of the World Bank and Professor at the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Reinhardt discussed her latest research on China's overseas lending and implications for developing countries. We then held two panels featuring industry leaders discussing US-China trade tensions and scholars from Hong Kong, Singapore, and Washington on economic effects of the pandemic. Today, we're starting our spring semester activities with a second keynote address by Professor David M. Lampton. Um, David Lampton, known as Mike to his friends and colleagues, is one of the world's best known and most respected scholars of Chinese politics and US-China relations. He recently retired as the George and Sadie Hyman Professor and the Director of Chinese Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS. Currently, he's a senior fellow at the SAIS Foreign Policy Institute. He received a BA, MA, and PhD in political science from Stanford University. And by my count, is the author or editor of a dozen books. Among the best known are Three Faces of Chinese Power, Might, Money, and Minds, published in 2008, Following the Leader, Ruling China from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, published in 2014, and most recently last year, Rivers of Iron, Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia. Professor Lambton is going to speak to us on the very timely topic today of the Biden administration turns to a deteriorating US-China relationship. After Professor Lambton's presentation, we'll have comments by Ms. Deborah Lair, a well-known practitioner working on China, among other topics. Ms. Lair is vice chairman and executive director of the Paulson Institute. She advises Chairman Hank Paulson on US-China relations and manages the Institute's Green Finance Center. While he was Treasury Secretary, Ms. Lair helped Mr. Paulson set up the very important US-China strategic economic dialogue. She's also worked in various positions in the US government, including serving as a Deputy Assistant US Trade Representative when she was a lead negotiator for China's entry into the WTO. In addition, she's held various important positions in both the private and nonprofit sectors. She has a BA from Trinity University, and as James said, um, an MA from GW. Before I turn the floor over to Professor Lambton, let me remind you that there will be a Q&A session after the two presentations. You can type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any time, and we will get to as many of these questions as possible. Mike, um, please go ahead with your presentation. Well, good morning to those of you on the Eastern time zone and good day to everyone else who's in other time zones around the world. Um, I wanna thank James Foster and Barbara Stallings for inviting me and the Institute for International Economic Policy and, and also the Seeger Center at GW. When I hear the name Gaston Seeger, the Seeger Center, I think of a great public servant, not only in relations with China, most notably under the Reagan administration, but as a, a great professor and thinker about US role in Asia more broadly. So I'm particularly honored to be taking part in this uh, program in this 13th annual conference that you're Having. I also want to thank my longtime colleague and esteemed colleague, Deborah Lair, who herself has contributed so much to the U.S.-China relationship, as, as well as their current activities at the Paulson uh, Institute. Uh, I guess the first thing we want to say is that I think the big problem in thinking about China policy at this point is to ask ourselves, where do we think China fits in the overall set of national priorities we need? Uh, and even the just the priority list of our national security priorities. There are lots of contenders for uh, primacy in our thinking at this time. 
And I guess if I was to put it a little just to foster discussion when we get to Q&A, I would say China is not our biggest problem. I don't think China is even our biggest security problem. That isn't to say it isn't a big problem in all regards it is. But we have to come to some understanding about what our relative priorities are and what we need to do as a nation to be more effective in dealing with China wherever we put it on our priority list. And I don't want to be mistaken to be saying that I have the answer to those questions. I think my job really is to raise the question and we can talk about it. I have my attitudes on that. Uh, but certainly among the priorities just with a national security uh, component is the pandemic. I mean, it's killing more people every day than we lost at Pearl Harbor uh, or on 9-11. Uh, we have global climate change, which Deborah and all of us are concerned about. We have the whole question of building the rebuilding the U.S. economy so that we will be effective both in our internal governance and our external affairs. Uh, we have an ongoing security challenge in the United States that as we speak, you know, we're not only talking about the national capital, we're talking about 50 capitals around the country, uh, state capitals. So the point is we've got lots of contenders for problems. And so where does China fit on this list? Uh, now, the US, the new incoming uh, uh, Biden administration, I wanna make clear, I, I have no substantive contact with them. I'm not speaking for them. They might agree or disagree with what I have to say. But I wouldn't want it misunderstood that, that I have any particular a connection there. I welcome that new administration, uh, but I do not purport to speak for them. Uh, but if I was to at least assess where I think uh, they will be uh, going, I think the first thing to say is that uh, we can expect some continuity with Trump uh, uh, administration policies and actions uh, and a, a tendency to uh, continue on some current policy lines, at least for a period until a reevaluation uh, can, can occur. That means that I think you're not going to see immediate change on tariffs. Uh, there's going to be a tendency towards tightening export and invest inward investment uh, controls on, on China. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, sanctions on Chinese leaders for human rights uh, infractions as they're in viewed in many places in the world, including uh, the United States. Uh, some changes in Taiwan policy will probably persist into the new administration. Uh, so that, and if you ask yourself, why is this? It is because this relationship began to deteriorate before Trump came along. Uh, it notably took a downturn in the latter part of the Obama administration, and some lines of current policy were in the Obama-Biden administration for before Trump came. And further, many of the American policies that we now see towards China are anchored, for better or worse, in a consensus in the U.S. Congress and in public opinion. And if you look at public opinion polls, you will find over the last year uh, not only an increase in uh, worry or sense of threat about China, but you will also see a convergence between the attitudes of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. So I guess the, the one overall message is anticipate, I anticipate change, but uh, not in all dimensions and not necessarily uh, rapidly. Now, there will be some changes that, uh, at least for me, and I, I think many people are going to be very welcome. First of all, there's going to be process improvement. I just to put it, the agency policy making process in the last four years has been somewhere between a little and nil. Uh, and I think you will see a restoration of a rational, fast, 
based, professionally executed policy. Now, I know all of those words need explanation and debate, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll, uh, at the moment, I'll leave it uh, at that. But there'll be process improvements. Uh, secondly, there will be, uh, I think, somebody on the Washington end of the phone when the Chinese want to call and get clarification. The degree to which we have had, had in, to, to say imperfect communication with China uh, bureaucratically is, uh, I think, an understatement, and we can explore that in Q&A. But I think there will be better communication, which will include better dialogue. Certainly, also, I expect more participation by the United States in multilateral organizations, whether they be in Asia or they be <clears throat> just multilateral organizations more broadly, uh, and also Paris Agreement on Climate Change, uh, WHO cooperation and participation, and so forth. So we'll have, I think, a better interaction or at least a clarifying interaction and communication with China. And particularly, I think there will be improvement in strategic dialogue with China and the United States. So this sort of overall context uh, setting, I think there will be changes and there will be continuity. Uh, and. Uh, the the as the Chinese would say, I think the administration is going to cross the river by feeling the stones one by one, to quote a Chinese saying there. So I think that's where uh, we're going. Now we need a little for the discussion, also a little context about a China context. You know, in the same way that the United States has its politics, its limits, its constituency, so does China. And I think a too frequent, infrequently discussed aspect is China, in effect, has its own, I'll say, elections in air quotes. Uh, and China has an upcoming very important 20th Party Congress uh, in 2022. And just as our campaigns and political posturing uh, uh, precede major uh, political landmarks like elections. So in China, political posturing uh, occurs for years before the uh, the event and the, the in the future uh, is going to be the 20th Party Congress. Xi Jinping is trying to consolidate and extend, I believe, his power indefinitely. And everything he does is to consolidate domestic control. And one of the aspects of China is it's in the one sense, as I will emphasize later, feeling its oats for having executed what it sees as many successful policies. The regime is also very nervous about its own domestic fragility. So one of the problems in dealing with China is this combination of insecurity and self-confidence, maybe excessive, exuberant self-confidence. So we've got to keep, I think, that in mind. But as because he is trying to consolidate his power, and for many other reasons, you see uh, Xi Jinping executing policies that are very distasteful uh, to many constituencies around the world and certainly in the United States, which would include consolidating power on the periphery when Chinese regimes feel uh, insecure, they consolidate power along their periphery. And you see great efforts in Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Tibet for China to uh, root out uh, what it would consider or Beijing would consider to be unreliable elements. And we see this uh, uh, every day in, in the news. You see also China trying to uh, exert uh, in a uh, high degree and in some cases coercive influence over smaller countries, not just on its periphery, but uh, uh, Australia, Norway, New Zealand. Uh, all of these countries have uh, increasing problems with China uh, when they deviate from what China considers its uh, core interests. So we have to keep in mind the, the phase of China's political life that it is in, as well as our own. Another part of this China context is China is making progress 
I would say is performing in gross economic terms quite well. I think there's a consensus among economists that China could very well grow at six or more percent this year, 2021. Now we all read, and it's true, China has debt problems, particularly corporate debt problems. China has a long-term demographic problems, lots of problems. But in this gross aggregate terms, China's now accounts for more than a third of global growth, as it has for some time. So China is not feeling as economically imperiled uh, as uh, probably it'd be fair to say the United States uh, feels at the current moment. And certainly China's performing in gross aggregate economic growth terms uh, better than almost any other uh, major uh, uh, country. Uh, also, China is taking the opportunity of this growth as a market and its two biggest trade partners now, Deborah will correct me or put more nuance to it, but is uh, the EU and Southeast Asia. And the United States uh, is going to find China trying to exploit the economic interests that other countries have in doing business with China to its advantage. And it will find receptive countries. Germany is an interesting country to talk about in terms of where it places economic and trade relations with China compared to the United States. China just formed uh, or just uh, uh, signed an agreement on the RCEP, the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, just signed an investment agreement with the EU. The point is that China is performing economically and that gives them leverage with the uh, the, the countries of the world, many of whom are our allies and agree with us on perhaps human rights issues, on security and military issues, but they have economic interests and each of our allies is balancing them. And they often strike a more pro-economic balance there uh, than at least our rhetoric here in the United States and particularly Congress often uh, suggests. So with all, all of this background, the China background, our transition background, uh, economic performance background, uh, I really want to just make three points. Uh, that was all the wind up, but the three major points I would say is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we got to where we are, because I don't think you can have intelligent policy about the future without recognizing what the past was and how you got to the current uh, circumstance. Second, I'd like to describe the balance sheet on US-China relations and the engagement policy for the last 40 years. Uh, I'm putting it a little crudely for the purposes of discussion, but there's a kind of storyline going around that the last 40 to 45 years of comprehensive, constructive engagement was a big mistake. And uh, I think that's not a correct understanding. And I'd like to share with you my understanding of the balance sheet, even while I would agree the current situation have pointed to and will continue to point to. Uh, the third point is all of this aside, Certainly what the Biden administration, I think, is thinking about in part is how can we move forward from this situation in a certainly the least damaging way, but hopefully the most uh, constructive way. So let me address those three points serially, and then I'm looking forward to getting to our questions. How did we get to where we are? And it's a long complex story and I'll do, this will be a very imperfect uh, synopsis. But I think the first thing we can say is it's a conjunction, as I believe all big historical events are, is a conjunction of preceding events and development. Rarely does one master variable, so to speak, explain a complicated uh, trajectory. And I certainly think that's true in US-China relations. 
Uh, first and foremost, if you sort of say, what's my macro biggest variable I think that we have to keep track of is the security relationship between the United States and China. Nixon essentially and Mao and Zhou and Lai and Kissinger and later Carter and Brzezinski all saw security and aligning with China to offset balance and otherwise frustrate in Afghanistan and elsewhere, the Soviet Union. And that created a very compelling uh, rationale for coordinated cooperative behavior. And you find under Gaston Seeger and President Reagan, uh, the United States supplying weapons to China to fight the Soviet Union uh, in, in uh, China helped us get them into Afghanistan and so forth. So that security really allowed us to overcome our ideological uh, problems. We didn't have much of an economic relationship with China, and that wasn't a big motivator for Nixon and Kissinger or Mao for that matter. Uh, but we did have a security rationale. Now, when the Soviet Union went away, that rationale diminished considerably. That was a problem for the relationship. But 9-11 came along and we needed uh, or wanted China's cooperation on fighting global terrorism. And uh, Jiang Zemin was one of the first leaders in the world to call uh, President George W. Bush. Uh, and uh, when Bush had said, you're with us or against us, Jiang Zemin was on the phone in a big hurry saying, we're with you. So you had a not as robust a security relationship in the 2000s, but you had at least a security rationale that we didn't need any more problems and China was at least minimally uh, cooperative. Uh, well, that is no longer the, and also much of this was premised on China uh, staying weaker nationally and its PLA not modernizing as rapidly as it proved able to do, particularly in the 2000s and in the, uh, the more recent, uh, the first two decades of the new millennium. So also now you see China moving closer to Russia. You see China also being more ro robust in, uh, let us say in the Chinese view, uh, re-legitimating its claims to uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, as I said, exerting uh, more control over its periphery and all of the developments in the South China Sea. So to make a very long, and, and that was a truncated description sh short, uh, the security relationship is turned from a positive reinforcing of the relationship consideration to now there is a negative, it's a negative and driving factor. And if you look at the Trump administration, but you don't have to start with the Trump administration, look back to the Obama-Biden administration, that was when the pivot of 2011, a reorientation of uh, particularly naval forces towards the Pacific, a more robust U.S. security strategy that became the Indo-Pacific strategy, all dates before Trump and reflects the greater wariness and dissatisfaction in security terms. But the thing about security is it doesn't just stay in the narrow security realm. It also, I'll say, infects, and I don't mean it to be as negative as that, that, uh, that word suggests, but it sort of metastasizes into the economic area. Because if you define a country as a security problem, then you have to ask yourself, what are you exporting? What resources are you providing that could be used against us? And so you've seen a steady consensus of increasing export controls, technology transfer. But in the United States, you can't keep that in the economic realm because it immediately spills to the educational, cultural exchange, uh, and dialogue realm. Because we have now 350,000 plus Chinese students and scholars and others in American research universities. Uh, and uh, that becomes a, then an issue of what are the implications of the technology transfer there. 
what we've seen is uh, in broad brush, and all of this deserves a lot more discussion, is a deteriorating security relationship pushing through the economic uh, uh, interdependence positive peace through trade rationale. Uh, that gets drawn into question and then spills over even into the cultural exchange area uh, with the U.S. canceling Fulbright program, uh, also NIH worried about who it's making grants to, uh, and so forth. So we can talk all uh, uh, more about that. But my point is, this has been a long-term process of degraded security re uh, relationship uh, or a deteriorating security relationship spilling over into economics and cultural exchange. But that's not the only thing, but I'm just saying if you, you, you have one factor that's sort of the master driver here, I think that's a very important one. Also, there's a perceptual uh, dimension, and here I would, perceptions in all directions by different groups to be sure, but I think there's a kind of national perception in China that's been developing really since 2008 and 2009. And that is, to put it crudely, the U.S. on long-term decline and China on long-term rise. And I, in, in my work on negotiation, I think one thing is clear. When the Chinese see your power position eroding, they then feel more entitled and able to push for more of their interests. And I think the global financial crisis was a watershed in Chinese attitudes towards the national trajectory of the United States. Uh, all the recent developments uh, have the Chinese in the United States fed into that, reinforced that. But I think the key point probably was the global a financial crisis. So the basic mindset in China is we account for one third of global economic growth. Our, we have big trade partners all over the world. We'd like to get along with the US, but we don't have to provide them the deference that we used to when we were in a much more subordinate position. And my conversations with Chinese leaders and track 1.5 and 2 and interactions all underneath is a China that thinks it's increasing power, entitles it as uh, Xi Jinping at one point says, we will have more say. That is a consensus. And, you know, the U.S. can have its preferences, but when you're dealing with 20% 20, 20 of the world's people, you have to care what they think. And I think that's a pretty good one sentence statement about what they think. Uh, of course, there are many other things going on. This global strongman tendency isn't just in China. It's not just in Washington under Trump, but it's a global phenomenon in part in reaction to rising global inequality and a desire for people to have more control over their destiny and strongman, I'll say strong person uh, leadership uh, is uh, one at least presumed avenue to achieve those kinds of nationalistic objectives. I think just in passing, and this isn't a gratuitous uh, um, uh, partisan remark, but I think if we historians look back and say what was really an important statement, I think Pence's couple of statements uh, at the Hudson Institute are important. But if I had to finger one, I'd say, take a look at uh, Pompeo's, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo's July 23rd, 2020 speech uh, on what I will call regime change in China. And that speech, in effect, confirmed, I think, many Chinese views that the purpose of American policy is to change the Chinese Communist Party. Now, you can say that. That's not true. You can say that's not feasible. You can say many things. He didn't speak even for his own administration necessarily. But the Chinese pay attention to things, and they paid attention to that. Uh, and, of course, his later move on the Taiwan Guidelines of 1994 
uh, is a whole nother story of the last week or two we can talk about. So uh, long and the short of is, is this deterioration happened over a long time for many reasons, but at the heart of it is a declining security uh, relationship. Point two, and I, I, uh, I, I think this is particularly important because if you don't appreciate the past, you're going to bumble in the future. That's my basic uh, orientation. And I think that at the same time, we realize the comprehensive nature of the deterioration we're involved with with China. We need to recognize what the gains of the more constructive approach of the past were, not out of the idea that we can replicate them, because I don't think we can entirely. But we need to recognize what are the prices we're going to pay if we aren't modulating ourselves going into the future. And I don't uh, may, let it let me make it clear the achievements of the Chinese people in the last 45 years. The Chinese people John, uh, deserve the bulk of the credit for that. Uh, I'm not trying to say the help of the United States of the West uh, was the told explanation for why China did well. I think China did well for many reasons, but one reason and an important reason was the constructive engagement policy. And when China did well in the last 45 years, in many respects, the world did well in security and economic terms. Lots of problems. Ultimately, those problems overwhelmed uh, our sense of gain, and we ch we're changing policy. But I want to recall what were some of those gains, because they were tremendous. And many of them in, were in human rights areas. So, for example, and it's well known that uh, under in China, uh, per capita income in China in the early 1970s, when Nixon and Kissinger uh, and, and Mao and Zhou engineered the change, China was poorer in per capita terms than Haiti and Cambodia. So, that meant that China was had tremendous poverty and malnutrition. And in the fourth in this scheme of this 40 some years, China moved 500 million plus people out of poverty. And in the night from the 1990s on, China was one of the biggest contributor to improved malnutrition in the world. So you know, economic growth and development and stability have enormous implications for poverty and human values. So it seems to me constructive engagement contributed to these results was a huge human rights plus. It isn't the whole human rights story, but it was a plus. Take another case. When I first was going to China in the uh, uh, mid 1970, I went first in 1976. Just taking an airplane ride in China was a sort of life imperiling uh, experience, to put it a little uh, starkly. But flying in China wasn't safe. Uh, once Boeing saw China as a market, it cooperated, as did, in fact, Airbus. But the FAA uh, sent experts to China and both for commercial and safety re reasons helped China build the safe among I'll say among but as safe as the US air traffic and air management control system allowed China to fly many more planes safely uh, allowed the fact to arise that Boeing now sends about one out of six of its aircraft to China so this was a huge win-win in terms of air safety, passenger flight. The expansion of business couldn't have happened without all of this. So I think this is a tremendous success that we often don't think about. Another whole uh, area is uh, just look at, uh, I, I live near the mall in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and I take my exercise every day. And what are the monuments I walk by? I walked by the Korean Memorial. I walked by the Vietnam Memorial. 
I walked by the World War II memorial. And all of those, China played an important role, positive or negative. But the basic fact of engagement is from really from Nixon, after we got out of Vietnam in 1975, the U.S. has had no conflict involving China. And uh, China has waged no international conflict of significance since its uh, border war with uh, China in or Vietnam in 1979. So I count among the gains of constructive engagements, the invo if you know, if you ask yourself, would I prefer the uh, uh, conflict situation with China before 1975 or after 1975? You've got to choose after 1975. So huge peace uh, dividend. I think of the normalization, and uh, we shouldn't therefore underestimate what the conflicts of uh, uh, would be. Uh, just let me make a final point, and then I'll wind up for our Q and A uh, uh, session here. Uh, as we enter the uh, the uh, Biden era, and China enters the era where President Xi is firmly entrenched in power. And I think we can expect out of the Biden administration, as I said, um, more professional, data-based, processed, uh, process-focused, uh, uh, rational, predictable uh, policy process. And therefore, I think we can see the opportunity for cooperation with China uh, in multilateral areas. They've already expressed a desire to re join the Paris Accord. I think the degree of non-cooperation we've had with respect to WTO recently and in COVID-19 has been a, a highly unfortunate. Indeed, health cooperation, both the United States with WHO China and the US CDC and NIH cooperating with China was a success story until the COVID-19 uh, I'll say debacle, and, and much of that, incidentally, is due to China. Uh, and we can talk more about that in uh, the Q&A. But the long and the short of it is, I think there will be an, a willingness to cooperate with China and with others with respect to China multilaterally, and I take that to be a, uh, a big positive. I think we ought to also think about what, uh, what economic uh, um, organizations we wish to either rejoin or join or agreements in the economic area that we might be able to move forward uh, with China. And certainly, uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Uh, I would hope, I don't, given all the other problems we've got that the new administration has to deal with, I'm not sure how quickly we can get to this. But I think the United States ought to join the successor to TPP that we pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that Japan took the reins on when the U.S. pulled out. We also, at the start of the, uh, at the end of the last, uh, the Biden or Obama-Biden administration, we were uh, talking about a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, Europe, the EU has just signed one. I'm sure there are going to be some problems they're getting everything ratified among 27 countries, but the Europeans are moving along with investment protection. I'd like to see the U.S. pick up uh, the reins uh, on that. Um, also, uh, I think another area that's, uh, I, I don't, as I said, speak for the Biden administration, but I, I, I believe and, and certainly hope they are considering is renewing uh, military very focused and strategic way. And let me say in that regard, it isn't just been the U.S. that's been resistant to that under Trump, but the Chinese themselves have been nervous about that. So I would certainly, this isn't that all the U.S. is the sole explanation for everything that's not going forward. The, uh, the Chinese themselves have presented obstacles. And to give you just one example, I was speaking not long ago to a, a relatively senior Chinese official, and I said one of the low-hanging fruits for us ought to be restoring the 
uh, Fulbright program and scholarly exchange and making foreign students more welcome in both our countries. And this person said, uh, in paraphrase, but Professor Lampton, don't you realize there are many people in China who see these educational exchanges as opportunities for peaceful evolution and uh, the opportunity to weaken the Chinese government party regime. So what looks to us like if we change our mind, it's not self-evident that the Chinese are all going to be lined up on restore the status quo ante. So none of this is going to be easy. But what I really would just end by saying is that I think that um, we need to recognize the problems. Uh, we need to recognize the past successes. We need to move as in constructive a direction as conditions will permit. We have many other priorities. But when all is said and done, a very big security priority is not having 20% of the world's population work against us. So thank you very much. I've enjoyed the opportunity to share my views with you. I look forward to friend Deborah Lair and her comments and your questions. Great. My pleasure. So it's always a pleasure to be back at the Elliott School. And thanks to Dr. Foster, Dr. Stallings for putting together this really excellent event. And I'm honored to be on the same virtual stage with Dr. Lampton, who's had such an impact on many generations of China scholars and China watchers, including myself. And I know it's much more interesting to watch a spirited debate when it comes to commentary on a presentation, but I have to admit that I agree with everything that Dr. Lampton just laid out. And so you don't get much disagreement or fire here. So instead, why don't I just tease out a few of the points that he raised and add a couple of additional thoughts myself. One, I totally agree that with the Biden administration coming in, we're really gonna see more of a change in style than in substance. As he said, it's a return to the professionals, to quite honestly, to the establishment. And so we'll see a more predictable policy and a more, more transparency in the policy making process. There's no turning the clock back to where we were. Uh, and I really believe that quite honestly, competition between the United States is now structural in the relationship and that we have to look at it that way. There are many of us who believe, uh, I think that the Trump administration diagnosed a lot of the right problems, but had the wrong prescriptions. And as we look at where we were four years ago, we certainly, um, can we say that we're better off in our relationship with China? Certainly, I think we're more re realistic in the relationship that we have in identifying a number of the issues across the board, whether it's intellectual property rights, the trade deficit, human rights, the security issues, Taiwan, the South China Sea, all of them are issues that we really had to have a very serious look at technology, but, just even looking at the most recent trade numbers, our trade deficit with China has continued to increase and the tariffs really have been a tax on the American people and a drag on our economy. And so I think it's hard to argue that the diagnosis was correct, but there is very strong bipartisan support for a tough policy towards China and we'll expect to continue to see that in the Biden administration. He'll have a different approach as Dr. Lambton was indicating he is more likely to reach out to our allies to try and strengthen global governance institutions like the World Trade Organization, like the WHO, and continue, I hope, to push bilaterally on trade and technology, but in ways that I hope won't hurt the United States. You know, there are over 400 pieces of legislation in the Congress now when it comes to China. That's more than there were after 9-11 on anti-terrorism. So we're going to have to find a way to work with China. They're not going away. They continue to be a powerhouse, whether it's from a security perspective or an economic perspective. So we need to come up with a new framework for the relationship. And change will come slowly because the new administration does have other priorities. 
they're going to have to deal with COVID. We have to deal with our own economic crisis. We have to deal with our own internal uh, issues as we're seeing as Washington DC is now an armed camp. The tariffs that put in place, it's gonna be very difficult politically for the new administration to come in and start to lift them without being perceived as having achieved something for taking those steps. And while it may not be a priority, there are some issues that the administration is going to have to tackle early on. One is going to be the new changes that have taken place with our policy towards Taiwan and some of the recent executive orders that the administration has put in place. We see them churning them out as quickly as they can. They're very clearly trying to box in the Biden administration with some of the steps that they've taken around delisting Chinese companies. What a farce we saw with the New York Stock Exchange and three of China's major telecom companies where they were delisting, then they weren't, then they were. I mean, talk about us looking incompetent. It continues to unfortunately reinforce that we can't even understand what our own policies are. The same with the executive orders, quite honestly, towards TikTok and towards um, WeChat. The fact that they were not able to be to hold up in court, that there's been this long drag, dragged out process, and there was a real lack of understanding of the implications for American companies and how American companies were going to get hurt by some of the steps that the administration was taking, because it's not only that our companies communicate with their Chinese staff on WeChat, but most of their payments are done in China through these kinds of payment platforms. And if they're not allowed to use them, it severely hampers their ability to do business in China. Although maybe that was one of the intents of the um, administration. And that technology is going to be one of the battlegrounds. Uh, my boss, Hank Paulson, has talked about his concern of an economic iron curtain that we're starting to see divisions uh, between if you're using Chinese technology, you can't come on our platforms and vice versa. It's not to say that the United States started this. Certainly the Chinese um, firewall has had big implications for our own technology companies' ability to operate in China. But as we look to our own competitiveness, and certainly the United States remains a leader in it, um, sectors around artificial intelligence and big data, that if we are not able to find ways to continue to be innovative and in supporting our innovative industries, but also allowing them to commercialize their technology, particularly one of the largest uh, markets and opportunities in the world, it's again gonna have an impact on our own competitiveness. So we need to find ways to ensure our national security, as Dr. Lampton points out, that we're looking very seriously at uh, technology exports, but doing it in a way that doesn't hurt our own competitiveness and our own innovative companies, that we have high walls around small fields, a small field. And related to that too is the flow of students. Uh, if you look at artificial intelligence and the Paulson Institute actually did a very good study around this, you'll see that the majority of um, students uh, getting higher degrees in artificial intelligence got their undergraduate degrees overseas. And the majority of those are from China. And then looking to the workforce, the majority of those who did receive their undergraduate degrees in foreign countries um, still working in the workforce are Chinese. And so Chinese students tend to come, they stay, they work, and are some of the major contributors to the competitiveness of some of our industries. We don't want to push them away and send them back to their own country forcibly to become competitors to us. Switching to China, as Dr. Lambton was talking about, she comes out very strong um, coming out of COVID. Uh, he's launched a 14th five-year plan, reorienting the com uh, economy towards domestic consumption. A lot of people interpret this, that this is going to be China closing its walls to foreign companies. I think it's quite the opposite. We're seeing them continue to decrease the negative list, encouraging foreign investment, 
encouraging foreign companies to come sell China. If it is going to build up domestic consumption, its companies are not going to be able to meet that demand alone. They're going to need imports from other countries, but they are definitely going to diversify away from American companies. And we've already started to see that with the relationships that they're very actively building up in the Middle East and in Latin America in our own backyard. Uh, they are looking ahead to the future in the fiscal reform that they're using to also jumpstart their economy. Unlike in 2008, when they had the massive stimulus program that in many ways was wasteful spending and had a major impact on their own uh, environment, they are very targeted or attempting to be targeted, I should say, in the um, fiscal stimulus that they're doing and using it to build out ex some existing infrastructure, but more important to be focused on the infrastructure of the future with building out their own uh, high-tech platform, particularly for 5G. And they're using that platform. They're going into other emerging markets where the technology is sometimes more suited than the higher and advanced technology that we have. And of course, we don't even have a manufacturer of 5G technology. So we're not competitive in that area. And we haven't had much luck in encouraging our allies even to take out existing Huawei technology in their own build out. If China is able to move ahead with those technologies, which are not compatible with any, you know, the 4G technology that Huawei has put in is not compatible with any other kind of equipment. So you have to use Huawei technology to move to 5G or spend millions of dollars ripping out the old technology. Um, this is an area I think that that is going to be a big challenge for the administration because China, it allows China to build out its own technology ecosystem off of that 5G system. Um, Dr. Lampton raised the trade issue as well. Uh, China has been very smart in what it's been doing on the trade front. It did negotiate the um, bilateral investment treaty with the EU against the objections of some in the Biden administration. It did finish. RCEP, and they've talked about joining TPP. They are also pushing very hard for WTO reform, which you will recall the United States has uh, been basically pulling out of and, and really not using to the full degree that it should be used or investing anything in upgrading the WTO. This is going to present some very difficult decisions for the administration early on as they look to what their own trade strategy is, because now we're playing catch up. And I do agree with Dr. Lambton, it would be very smart to join the existing TPP, but I think it becomes politically challenging for the administration because many of the things that the United States had pushed for around the environment and labor policies were dropped as soon as the United States pulled out. So it's not the same agreement that it was when we had originally looked at joining at the end of the Obama administration. And Dr. Lampton also talked about security bleeding into the economic areas. I would look at it sometimes perhaps because of my background on trade the other way around. The Chinese ambassadors said not too long ago that Chinese political and security interests are gonna follow their investments overseas. And we definitely see that happening as China is diversifying, as China looks to very strategically investing in countries along the Belt and Road. And while overall investments have gone down given the slowing of their economy, they've been strategic in where they are now placing those investments in major infrastructure projects, but doing it in countries where they're looking to gain some um, political advantage. And so we see this again, uh, they're looking to um, increase their presence in the UAE, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, and certain strategic countries in Latin America. They're looking to negotiate free trade agreements with some of these regions. Uh, they are definitely looking to solidify those relationships through using their economic might. And that is going to lead, I think, to some challenges to the Biden administration's approach to their China policy. Because as they look to building uh, partnerships and alliances with the EU and how to approach China, the EU is going to likely be willing to coordinate when it comes to areas where they see it in their own interest, 
but where in the past they may have been inclined to coordinate with us overall because of the special relationship that they had recognizing the political reality that the Trump administration got 75 million votes and in four years we could be facing again a Republican presidency or even a Trump-like candidate, they're going to be very cautious in how they proceed. And so I think that they're going to be more independent in their policy. And again, where it's in their interest, they will coordinate with us. But as we saw with the conclusion of the investment treaty in some areas, they're going to go it alone. One point I would like to add to Dr. Lampton's question of how did we get here is um, to add about what I see is the failure of the World Trade Organization. And when we negotiated China's accession to the World Trade Organization, keep in mind that the WTO was still a very young institution. And the uh, whole idea of bringing China in was that this new entity had been created that for the first time was a multilateral institution with real teeth and that it would continue to evolve and reflect the issues of the day. That never happened. The WTO has hardly changed since it was created in the early 1990s. It does not reflect many of the pressing trade issues that we face today, whether it's e-commerce or the technology issues. And when the WTO agreement with China was negotiated, essentially the terms were about eight to 10 years. And in all that time, we have not had a new round in the WTO, nor have we had a bilateral trade agreement with China. The TPP didn't go through, which was supposed to help create some guardrails, and the bilateral investment treaty was never concluded. So I think this lack of structure was also one of the challenges uh, that we saw, including our increased reliance on cheap imports coming from China. Uh, I was so glad to hear Dr. Lampton's points on constructive engagement. There has been a lot of criticism of that in recent years and looking back. Um, it's true, we do need to rethink our relationship with China. It's not the same country that it was 10, 15 years ago. It's economic might, might is significant. Xi Jinping is a very different leader. Uh, but there were definite merits out of these and Hank Paulson often cites one uh, around the strategic economic dialogue and the fact that there he was able to create relations at senior levels. So when the financial crisis did come about, there was a certain level of trust and China was really able to carry a lot of the burden by not renegotiating uh, or, or depreciating the RMB and through the stimulus program that they used, which helped carry a lot of the global economy. And so he argues that that was one of the benefits that also came out of constructive engagement. So Deborah, I wonder if we can stop now and move towards some questions. I'm sure people want to turn sure. back to some of these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great, terrific. Thank you both very much for your presentations. They were, I think, very complimentary, if not confrontational, and gave us a, um, a good basis for some questions. Let me um, pick out some and see if we can move forward um, with this um, conversation. Um, here's a sort of a positive one, I think, to begin with. What are some immediate measures that the Biden administration can take to stop the deterioration of the relationship without looking soft or letting China off the hook on things like human rights? Uh, maybe you can start, and then, Deborah, if you want to come in on that, too, you can do so. Well, uh, this is an overall point that I see question. Uh, I think the U.S. will not be effective in dealing with China in general unless we up our internal economic gain, increase our comprehensive national power, and increase our credibility. That, that might sound like a dodge, but it isn't. We've seen the enemy, and it is us in not 100 percent, but in some significant measure. The Chinese are more cooperative with people they think they need to be cooperative with and whose policies are not self-evidently self-contradictory. So I would say job one is to get our own house in order. Now, I know we need to do more than one thing, uh, and that's not specific, but I think that's actually the most important thing we can do at this point. Secondly, to find common ground with our I'll say allies and friends. 
I, I just wrote a book on uh, China building high speed rail to Southeast Asia. And uh, it, there are seven Southeast Asian countries involved. And I interviewed in, uh, 158 interviews in the area. And I, I even interviewed in Cambodia, Myanmar, and uh, Vietnam. Uh, and the long and the short of it is they said, you know, if you want us to cooperate more, you've got to make it easier for us to cooperate and provide some resources for cooperation. Uh, you can't expect us not to cooperate with the Chinese when they're the only game in town. So we've got to decide what priorities are we going to hold our economic activity with respect to be it Cambodia or less so Vietnam at the moment or Myanmar or other countries where we have, uh, let's say, human rights and other disagreements hostage, or are we going to focus on uh, downplaying some uh, concerns in order to get larger cooperation? That's a political decision. I don't have any moral uh, high ground uh, to say what that ought to be. But the point is, if we want friends to cooperate, we have to accommodate. And if we're not willing to accommodate, then we're going to get less cooperation. And I think you would even see that with respect to the recent, uh, as Deborah pointed out, the uh, investment treaty. So I think that's sort of big picture. S small picture is I think the health and education areas ought to be areas we ought to be able to cooperate. Now, China's got a lot of blame here, particularly in health. Just look at the New York Times today and the treatment of the uh, World Health Team that's been sent to uh, China to try to uh, understand better the origins of the COVID-19. So China's got to do this, but health and education were some of the earliest areas of cooperation. I think we ought to try to get the Fulbright program back up and running. We ought to not treat Chinese students uh, you know, as sort of uh, security suspects. Uh, so I would say those two realms ought to be relatively low hanging uh, a fruit. A final thing is uh, that I think we need to, uh, uh, if I would have a criticism of the uh, dialogue process of the Obama Biden administration, it was there were too many people in too many agencies, in too many forums having dialogue to the point where they were just, uh, you know, almost becoming symbolic fractured events devoid of policy. They would come out with hundreds of policy recommendations, which just adds up to being nothing really, because you can't sort them out all at the end. So I think we ought to have more, a fewer high level, serious, strategic dialogues. Now, once again, we're not the only problem. China does is very nervous about talking about the strategic realm with the United States. So that won't be easy. But I would say strategic realm, improve our game, education, health. Those would be where I'd start. I would just add very quickly that many of the challenges that we are facing are not going to be bilateral challenges, they're going to be multilateral challenges, whether it's climate change, nuclear nonproliferation, pandemics. And so we need to find a framework to work with China because if the two largest economies in the world can find solutions, we're more likely, or find agreement, we're more likely to get uh, broader agreement on these types of things. So I think climate change, and clearly from the lineup that the administration has, from John Kerry to Brian Deese to others, climate change is going to be a clear priority of the administration. Here on the in the Q and A, but let me um, see if we can first look at some others, and maybe we can come back to climate. Um, a couple of questions on the issue of um, more political topics, specifically Taiwan. Um, here's a question that says, can you elaborate on the likely path of U.S.-China relations concerning Taiwan? For example, will the Biden administration reverse or continue the Trump administration's recent moves on government-to-government -government communications? We can deal with that quickly and then move on to, because I've got a long list of, of questions. Well, this, this is the most sensitive issue in U.S.-China relations, meaning capacity to escalate rapidly to a very big problem. 
So it has to be managed carefully, and I have confidence in the people that have been identified as playing a role in the new administration, uh, that this will be managed with sensitivity. Uh, I don't speak for them as a anticipate that uh, they would uh, try to push back towards what you might call the status quo ante before uh, Pompeo's uh, uh, about a week ago a statement about uh, ending self-imposed restraints. Um, uh, I think they may not make big announcements, but they will act more prudently than Pompeo's statement. Uh, the essence of Pompeo's statement really was to put a management more clearly in the AIT, which is the American Institute in Taiwan, a nonprofit so-called organization uh, that works closely with the State Department. I doubt I. I doubt the State Department would want to give up the the control that 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 statement seemed to imply, uh, and therefore I think you will see sympathy with the idea of giving Taiwan more dignity, quiet ways to try to have that happen, but less confrontational and megaphone diplomacy. Particular, Deborah, anything on Taiwan? No, I think uh, Dr. Lampton added. Yeah. Said it all beautifully. Okay. Um, so keeping on the same um, political security line for a moment, um, there's a question here about what is likely to be the Biden um, policies respect to the South China Sea. Mike? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm glad to address it. I was just uh, saying Deborah might uh, would have something interesting to say. South China Sea, uh, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, South China Sea, I think the administration, remember, was Clinton in uh, 2011 and, and, well, in 2010 at Hanoi that raised the issue of the South China Sea and seemed to suggest a new, more concerned direction for American policy. So I would think, uh, not speaking for the incoming administration, uh, they, they would have every bit as much concern about the South China Sea, and indeed, a lot that's been very disconcerting has happened since, obviously, since 2010, 2011. Uh, so I would expect to see the new administration continue the trend of reorienting naval and other forces in that direction. Uh, I would not see a change. I think that the, the, the new administration is certainly on board with the idea of an Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, and we'll we'll see uh, one way to uh, address the China challenge is to get cooperation of others in the region. So I would say, basically, same policy, more sophisticated implementation. Yeah, I'm surprised that he would think you would have something to say about this, but please, if you do. Um... Move right ahead. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that uh, that they're going to be looking at the military issues very carefully. And South China Sea was one of the things that this group focused on very carefully. Uh, I think Kurt Campbell has very definite views and coming in as the Asia czar and responsible for the pivot is going to be looking at building alliances with many of the um, Asian countries who are concerned about China's increasing um, use of its power to bully them into certain types of policies. And even before they've come into office, you saw that Jake Sullivan was tweeting out in support of Australia. And so finding ways, whether it's through our foreign policy, through our economic, capabilities or through a show of force in the military, they're going to want to stand by our allies in the Asia region. And that's going to include on the South China Sea. Okay, we've only got about eight minutes by my count um, remaining in the Q&A part. Uh, many of our listeners and participants are interested in economic aspects. Um, Deborah clearly put that as a, a prime um, part of her comments. Maybe we could start with the general issue of decoupling, which is discussed so much both in the press and also in academic literature. What do you think about this idea? Is this possible? Is this desirable? 
to what extent, in what areas, what could we say? Perhaps, Deborah, you could start with this um, and see if Mike um, wants to add on um, in this area. Certainly, we've heard four years of discussion about decoupling, and the reality is there's been very limited. I think more of a force of decoupling was COVID and the quick shutdown of China this time last year exposed some of the vulnerabilities that companies had to having two sources of product, but both in the same country. And so we've seen a diversification of country, not necessarily um, product or intent to get out of China. That said, there are areas where there is definitely going to be decoupling. Anything to do with our national security, and that's been broadened to include medical devices, medical equipment, and making sure that we have our own capabilities in those areas. But we have not seen a massive decoupling as the, as the Trump administration had hoped. And recent surveys of US businesses show that not only um, do they intend to stay in China, many of them are actually increasing their presence in China because of looking at what the opportunities are with the growth that they see for China ahead. Um, I, I, um, I agree with what said, and I wanna recall an earlier point she made that I thought deserves uh, re-emphasis. And uh, this, the, what philosophy do you bring to economic uh, and security interface in US-China relations? And I think you said, Deborah, higher walls, but a, a smaller perimeter, so to speak. In other words, figure out what you really need to protect and then protect it, but don't get indiscriminate because you can't control too much. Uh, I was at the National Academy of Sciences in 1983 to five. And at that time, the National Academy of Sciences was asked that question with respect to the Soviet Union. And they issued a report, which I would commend the current or the incoming administration to look at, called the Corson Report. And essentially what they says, said is, we got to keep our R&D uh, accelerated. That's the key. We got to keep ahead. That's, that's the, the best defense is an offense. Uh, and so higher walls around key technologies, uh, but not indiscriminate. Our allies will not follow us on an indiscriminate uh, policy. So I think that's a uh, key. I would just say one other is in this whole area, and I agree decoupling is not feasible because our allies don't want it. Southeast Asia it sees its economic in future uh, as in considerable part dealing with China. So we've got to control what's essential, uh, but not be indiscriminate because we'll lose allies. Finally, this is a race to set standards. We've got to compete economically around the world or Chinese technology is increasingly going to set standards. And you see this in areas like high speed rail, for example. So what I'm saying is I agree entirely with what Deborah said, but we have to have an open around this track with, in a sense, uh, Soviet Union was never the competitor China is, but in, in any other than nuclear or nuclear weapons. But the point is control less, better, win allies in that control effort and up our R&D and standard setting comp competitive capacity. Okay, here's a question that um, is related here. Um, the Trump administration initially put a lot of emphasis on intellectual property and the alleged theft of intellectual property um, by various Chinese actors. Is this still a major topic? Will it be in the Biden administration? And what kind of policies might be followed in this particular area of IP? So, you know, we actually negotiated three IPR agreements in the 1990s, but we knew that this was a long term issue because ultimately, even though we could put the frameworks in place and China, you know, arguably has a world class legal framework for IPR, the key was always going to be enforcement and there wasn't going to be adequate enforcement until China, China had their own intellectual property and then they would have an incentive to protect it. 
And that's what we've seen. We've seen tremendous progress. There's still a long way to go. The administration did address one of the core issues, which was requiring tech transfer as a condition of investment. But this is going to be an ongoing issue as long as China remains a slightly wild west when it comes to law enforcement and um, and in the provinces, it's still an issue that companies find. And uh, Barbara, I'd only add that in your question, you said alleged theft. <laughs> I don't think there was much of debate, maybe about the magnitude, but not the the, the uh, actual occurrence. Well, the, not the fact. Yeah. And I, I would make a distinction too between you know, the copying of, you know, somebody's intellectual property, you know, in the days we were doing this, it was CDs to cyber theft and cyber theft is a whole other different category. That is something that affects truly our competitiveness. That is something that needs to be addressed in a very serious way and is an ongoing issue to go in and this corporate spying that we see to steal our intellectual property in that way is a significant issue. It's it's sort of one of the modern day challenges and we need to find a way to work on an international basis, I think, to try and address cybersecurity theft. Okay, I have gotten permission from the powers that be to go an extra five minutes if Mike and Deborah can give us another five minutes of your time. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, so. There are, again, as I said before, I mean, we started a conversation about climate change, but there are lots of, there's lots of interest on that. Um, here is one of the questions. It said that climate change is one of the most pressing issues above, above China. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Um, with, respect to, with respect to national security. Okay, so China's considering climate change as national security. With the Chinese being responsible for more global warming than any other country, how does the U.S. get them on board with this message? What kind of what could we do to bring about um, some kind of collaboration cooperation in this area? Is this, as Deborah indicated before, a ripe area for moving into? Um, how should we think about this? Well, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, spit out a, a short answer and let Deborah do the heavy lift. Uh, if I was thinking back on my remarks, uh, I would emphasize to a greater degree than I did the importance of climate change, particularly on possibilities for future cooperation. So I want to redress that imbalance in my final recommendations. Uh, my impression is that China itself now recognizes, and this is by that I mean Xi Jinping and more popularly, that climate change is a threat to China. That's a big deal. Yeah. And before the basic line was, you guys created the problem, meaning you, the West, you guys solve it. And when we're rich, maybe we'll become more cooperative. Yeah. I think the Chinese have changed that fundamental point of view to say, well, this is a problem for us and we can't fiddle while Rome's burning entirely. So I think what we're, we should try to do is find those areas where we can cooperate. I don't want to say we're pushing against an entirely open door, but it's more like that than it was, say, certainly five to 10 years ago. So I, I, I would push the carry dimension of this policy as far and as fast as we could. Let me just say a few words. I think that China not only looks at it as a, a economic issue, uh, you know, both in the negative of the toll it takes on their economy, but also Goldman Sachs did a report that estimated that the opportunities for the private sector in environmental goods and services in China were a trillion dollars. They also see, so they see it as an economic issue at home and again, as something that they can be competitive in and a foreign policy issue. It's very much part of their strategy with uh, the European Union and to work with them. And so, it was very interesting. The Eurasia Group put out their ten risk, their, their top ten risk assessment for 2021, and one of the things that they identified was competition and climate technology. Absolutely, China has got an incredibly ambitious program when it comes to climate. Their goals to reach 2020 at 2030 um, peak, and then 2060 carbon neutrality. 
It is going to be a huge transformation of their economy. They have a massive program growing on in green finance that is incredibly innovative that we don't see coming from here. We see some of it coming through innovative things that the private sector is doing, but certainly it hasn't been led from the top. In this new administration, we will see that. So I see that there's opportunity for cooperation if we're creative and how we do it with China, but also it's another area where we may find ourselves in global competition if we don't handle it appropriately. Okay, I wonder if we can finish off by um, picking up on scattered comments about alliances. If there's one thing the Biden has pushed in terms of their foreign policy priorities, it's reestablishing strengthening alliances. But both of you have indicated that this isn't going to be as easy um, as perhaps might be desired by the new administration. What suggestions can you give them? What lessons might we learn in terms of how to go about trying to strengthen um, relations with our partners in various parts of the world? And finish off with this question, for both of you. This is a very serious question and I don't want my answer to seem non-serious. But let's quit affirming them by throwing tariffs randomly on our allies as much as China. So low-hanging conceptual fruit may not bureaucratically be or congressionally be so easy, but let's quit threatening the economic interests of our allies if we want them to cooperate. I think, you know, that would be start one. Secondly, uh, I certainly share the general view that our uh, friends and allies uh, need to do more in terms of carrying the burden of their own defense. But uh, the degree and the tenor by which that's been pursued for the last four years has done nothing but alienate our allies. So I would say day one, let's start being less incendiary economically and in security terms to our friends. Deborah, last word? <laughs> well, I would agree with that uh, completely. And I think one, we need to define what it is we want to be in this modern world as the United States. Um, it's more than just America first. For America's strength, we need to be a leader and we need to be working with our allies. And we have always been leaders in the global institutions. And we should be looking at how to reform those and how to ensure that we've got the global governance, whether it's the WHO, the WTO, that are strong institutions with strong American leadership to address the challenges that we're gonna be facing, not just bilaterally, but multilaterally in the world. Perfect. Thank you both very much for your um, very interesting and useful, both your presentations and your um, back and forth in our Q&A. Thanks to our participants for their questions. Um, I think this has been a really interesting conversation. Obviously, we could go on for a lot longer, but we don't have the time. Um, so again, thank you very much for uh, being with us today um, at IIEP.